When Joe Viscasil went to work on a particular day in 1996, he was faced with one of the most difficult tasks of his career. His job? To blow up the White House in one shot. Of course, the White House in question wasn't the real thing, and the task was required for the sci-fi classic Independence Day. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. The White House before him was a 14-foot wide, 1 12th scale model made from plaster, costing over $50,000 and hundreds of man hours. Each piece was individually crafted and made to look exactly like the real building. In other words, the pyrotechnics team had one shot to get this right. Everybody's very concerned because, of course, there's hundreds and hundreds of hours, tens of thousands of dollars, and what we really want to do is make sure that we just don't stub our toe at the last moment. To do this, though, they had to take many things into account. The camera speed was one of the more trickier elements as they needed to slow down the shot and the explosion itself to get it all in one take. In the end, the explosion took a week to plan and 40 explosive charges to detonate. And when it finally went off, and it went off. But the White House wasn't the only model used in the movie. In fact, for a movie known for its, at the time, cutting-edge visual effects, it actually holds the record for most miniatures used in any movie. One such example is the 124th scale model streets they created to film the infamous fireball scene, where the engulfing ball of fire hurtles towards the camera. The crew soon came across a practical issue, though. To get the shot, they had to hang the quote-unquote miniature, which was 8 feet wide and 20 feet long, from scaffolding at a 10-degree angle so the fire would make its way to the street as it ate fuel. The result? Independence Day may have the most amount of miniatures in a movie, but it was by no means the first. For that, we have to go back over 90 years. The first movie to use miniatures and the movie that is regarded as the pioneer of VFX is Georges Méliès' 1902 movie A Trip to the Moon, which incorporated miniatures into the shoot to make the dream of going to the moon from the comfort of a theater seat a reality. From there, miniatures became prevalent in the process of movie making, being used in the likes of Citizen Kane, Godzilla, and Metropolis the latter being one of the key inspirations behind Tim Burton's Gotham City and the visuals still hold up to this day. The most notable use of miniatures in this era is arguably the 1933 movie King Kong, which built small jungle sets where a 46-centimeter Kong made from metal, rubber, and fur could wreak havoc. The exquisite attention to detail and the process of matching the lighting of the miniature set with the rear projected images meant production for the movie lasted more than a year. But it was an even larger production that caused miniatures and models to leap forward in authenticity. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Kubrick was known for his obsessive attention to detail, and with a production length of three years, the prop department had the time to make the miniatures as realistic as they could, with many of the models detailed using parts from various Airfix model kits. As the movie is set in space, though, the models had to appear as if they were moving like a real spacecraft. But how exactly do you get these models to appear as if they are moving? That's where motion control came in. Motion control is a technique used in still and motion photography that enables precise control of camera movements. While the method wasn't created by Kubrick in 2001, they were certainly the pioneers in the craft, predominantly using large mechanical rigs that enabled precise and repeatable camera and model motion. 2001 may have been the pioneers, but another sci-fi epic really pushed miniatures and motion control into the future, Star Wars. At the time, the workers at ILM, the company behind the Star Wars models, had no idea how iconic their creations would become, with them even tossing a now invaluable Death Star original model. And that particular model was so funky, and I think someone dropped it at one time, it had a crack, and we threw it in the trash. 
Although it is now impossible to imagine the franchise without the classic style of X-Wings, TIE Fighters, or the Millennium Falcon, ILM actually had to redesign the original Millennium Falcon after running into copyright issues. And as they redesigned the Falcon to the quote, crushed hamburger style it has now, the production was delayed, leaving a bunch of angry carpenters in England waiting for the next remodel to be ready so they could get to work on the life-sized specimen needed for the film. For the space battles, the models were photographed with the use of motion control in front of a blue screen hanging from cables, and real explosives were used to make it appear as if the spacecraft were being shot down. But models and miniature sets improved even further in the sequel Empire Strikes Back. For the battle on Hoth, the planet's frozen wastelands were achieved by using a mixture of baking soda and microscopic glass bubbles to replicate snow, while the models that traversed the landscape were various sizes depending on the frame. To replicate movement, the models could only be moved a fraction of an inch, which took nine months to film in completion. The animators shot motion studies of animals in order to perfect the movements of their models. The snow walkers followed in this elephant's footsteps. The success of Star Wars led to a resurgence in the sci-fi genre, and where there was sci-fi there were models. One of the most notorious sci-fi films to use miniatures was Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. The colloquially known Hades landscape at the beginning of the movie was mostly achieved by using rows of acid-etched brass silhouette cutouts, and even the office interior in the long shot during the first scene was a model. What makes the office interior so impressive, though, is that it is only 9 inches in length, but still includes actual working fans. The miniatures in the original movie were used as reference for the miniatures in Denis Villeneuve's sequel, 2049. And when designing the models, the question was often asked, is this Blade Runner enough? Like the landscape in the original, the LA buildings were acid washed and were built at a 1 49th scale. However, the movie's antagonist, Neander Wallace's tower, was a 1 600th scale model, as that building in real life would be 3.5 kilometers tall. But it wasn't just sci-fi that employed the use of miniatures. From the 70s to the early 90s, miniatures were at the height of their popularity. Miniature sets were used to create sprawling deserts in Raiders of the Lost Ark, vast cityscapes in Escape from New York and Batman, giant monsters in Ghostbusters, and dystopian wastelands in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome and Batman Returns. Action sequences also benefited from the use of miniatures, such as the train sequence at the end of Back to the Future 3, which was pulled off by the use of a scaled-down train and DeLorean, as well as crafty low-angle camera shots. The tanker truck scene at the end of James Cameron's The Terminator was also achieved via the use of miniatures. Jim Cameron originally wanted to blow this a full-size tanker truck up, but he couldn't because where he was shooting it in downtown Los Angeles. So what Gene had to do was create the entire atmosphere in miniature, one six scale, in the front parking lot of Fantasy II in Burbank, and then blow up a miniature tanker truck. As the explosion would have taken place at the back of the truck, the pyrotechnics team set out 42 charges to give it a ripple effect. But things went very wrong on the first attempt, so the crew had to quickly hustle over the next few days to recreate the shot and eventually pulled it off for the second attempt. While it may have been technology that really brought miniatures to the forefront, it was also technological advancements in the early 90s that nearly killed off the craft. Steven Spielberg, who was actually one of the directors who helped popularize the use of miniatures, was also one of the first to be given the pinnacle of movie technology, CGI. While Jurassic Park did still use miniatures and models to bring the dinosaurs back to life, by being able to use CGI, Spielberg had an easier and more cost-effective means at his disposal. The movie then became a blend of miniatures, practical effects, and CGI, with more emphasis on the latter. This set the benchmark for movies to follow, with a number of movies in the 90s, including Independence Day, using this blend. Although miniatures have been, pardon the pun, scaled down, they have certainly not been killed off. Instead of being the whole scene, miniatures are now just a part of the scene, and are shot with a digital background, allowing compositors to insert matte paintings into the background. But what miniatures allow filmmakers to do is get wider shots of the location and to give the directors more flexibility with the camera and effects. 
Take the establishing shot of Hogwarts in Philosopher's Stone, or Sorcerer's Stone for all, all of us Americans out here, or an aerial shot of Isengard in Two Towers, for example. In fact, during production of Lord of the Rings, the crew used 64 miniature sets, which were so detailed that the full-size sets that used the miniatures as reference were actually known as bigatures. The most notable use of miniatures in the series were for the wide shots of Helm's Deep, Rivendell, Minas Tirith, and Fangorn Forest. For Fangorn Forest, only a small portion of the forest was actually life-size. We built a small portion of it full-size, and the full-size one we built had 12 trees in it. They did, however, run into a practical problem with the Fangorn Forest when a certain species decided to make the all-too-real miniature set their home. Yesterday, we must have had 150 tiny little baby money spiders all came dropping out all over the place. Now, miniatures are predominantly used in two ways. Firstly, auteurs such as Wes Anderson often use the method as an homage to the movies that inspired and influenced them, with the use of miniatures being rife in Anderson's Grand Budapest Hotel and, of course, his stop-motion works Fantastic Mr. Fox and Isle of Dogs. Another example is the Star Wars sequels and prequels, where people such as Adam Savage got their start, which pay homage to the original trilogy that popularized the art form. Secondly, they are used to make sure that the effects still hold up decades into the future, and do not fall into the uncanny valley trap. Even movies that are not as regarded for their visuals, such as Scorsese's Shutter Island and The Aviator, rely on miniatures for wide exterior shots of locations. However, there is a man who is known for his use of VFX and life-size practical effects that use miniatures in both ways, Christopher Nolan. Nolan has actually used miniatures on a number of his works, such as the creation of the Snow Fortress in Inception and the armed car chase scene in The Dark Knight, with a scaled model tunnel and miniature Batmobile and truck being used in the latter. So rather than overlighting the model, they actually really matched uh, the way in which we shot the sequence by pushing the film a stop and uh, very slightly underexposing the film. I think they were able to get something that, that cuts in very, very well with the the full-scale footage. But like so many in the genre, it was his sci-fi movie Interstellar that really made use of miniatures. Some of the spacecraft we see in the movie are life-size, but like 2001, some of the larger-scale craft are models. Take for example, the Endurance, which was a 1 15th scale of the full-size Endurance, using the motion control methods adopted by Kubrick to seamlessly photograph the model and give it the feeling that it is moving freely. But not only did it match the realistic quota, but the models were also an homage to 2001, and it is impossible to ignore the movie's similarities. It is fitting that one of the most recent sci-fi movies with extraordinary visual effects uses methods from movies that brought audiences to space decades later. You sort of stand on the shoulders of giants, as I say, and you look at the techniques of the past, and you try and use them in a different way and add to that language, and in that way achieve a trick that, that people haven't seen before. Miniatures have allowed filmmakers to take us to places that would have been impossible to see otherwise, and over time, they have become a masterful art in their own right. From a trip to the moon, to 2001, to Star Wars and Interstellar, the sets may have been miniature, but they took us to grand places. Despite miniatures going somewhat out of style, they will never not be crucial when it comes to stop-motion animation. Movies like Star Wars and King Kong used a blend of stop-motion and live-action, but of course, there are studios out there like Ardman and Leica, as well as auteurs like Tim Burton and Wes Anderson that continue to use the craft. With them, this beloved practice that requires the utmost patience, love, and care will continue to live on in the miniature sets in which they take place.